And welcome into Broadcaster Hour. I'm Roger Hoover, joining you from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and from Gainesville, Florida. On the other side of the screen, we've got Kyle Crooks. And in the center of the screen, from his home just outside of Seattle, Washington, we have Rich Waltz joining us for Broadcaster Hour. And Rich, it's great to see you. How's everything going, my friend? It's good. It's good. I wish the sun was out here, but, um, you know, like, for quarantine life, it's, it's, a, it's a good place to spend, uh, to spend time. So thanks for the invitation. Now you're living outside Seattle now, so I don't think the sun is is ever out, right? Yeah, but you you can't lose hope, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm a I, I lived in Florida for 13 years, uh, grew up in Northern California. Uh, I'm used to the sun, so this is the time of year where you're like, hey, spring's right around the corner, and then it never shows up here until late May or June. So, so Rich, let me ask you, what's this season been like for you? And I've seen you doing baseball playoff games, and I see you on a network every night and, you know, doing college basketball, college football for CBS Sports Network. Just in this type of environment when you don't have crowds and, and you can't see coaches and players in person, just how different has it been for you? It's a challenge, but it's a uh, look, it's a great challenge. Uh, I lost, and I'm not alone, a lot of broadcasters lost a lot of work with baseball. Um, I lost like five months' worth of games. and um, So at this point, any game you get is a blessing. Any game you get, I'm happy to do it. If you, if they want me to do it here in this home office, I'm great. If they want me on a plane to go somewhere, hey, just let me know. So I think you're thankful for every game that you get. I had a, I think I had a 15-game football schedule, and four of those were canceled. So I had 11 football games. Um, I did get some postseason baseball and some baseball right at the end of the major league season. And basketball's been uh, fun. It's, uh, you know, some games here at home. CBS has put me on some Saturday games. Um, and so I've traveled for those, uh, traveled for a couple other uh, assignments. Um, traveling's not fun, uh, but being in an arena is. So you kind of weigh those two things. Um, and, and I think, look, in, in this environment, like the other night I was doing a game and uh, there was an internet hit apparently in my house, and so everything froze for like a minute and a half. And my partner Dan Dickow, when we do the games, we set up on on, on my phone and his phone, we set up a um, uh, a chat so that uh, a FaceTime so that we can see each other because I like to communicate non-verbally uh, during a, a game. And so, you know, Dan was looking at me like where are you? <laughs> and I'm like, Hey, it's all you. <laughs> and, um, and it came back on in two minutes, but you know, you come on and you say, Hey, look folks, we're, it's, we're broadcasting in a global pandemic. We're doing the best we can. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties and, and, and you move on and, and it's not the same. It's hard, but you have to accept the challenge. You got to do it with enthusiasm and say, that's okay. I mean, this, if this is the way we have to do games right now, I'm all in. So take me inside the, the home office set up for a broadcast. And you mentioned having your partner on, on the phone. Is he raising his hand to say, Rich, I have a point. So you limit the amount of time that you're stepping over each other. I assume that's that's the biggest point of having that. So you can see you know, exactly their hand gestures and if they're going to talk. So what is that communication like over that little camera? Uh, absolutely. That's it. I mean, uh, you know, when I do baseball or football or basketball or whatever sport, I like to tilt my, you know, adjust my monitors in the booth so that I can see the field and my analyst at, at the same time, because that nonverbal communication is, to me, is so key to developing chemistry and timing and, and all of that. You don't have it, obviously, in the in the home office. So, yeah, I mean, like in basketball, especially, that oftentimes when you go to break, uh, an analyst will take it to break if there's a big highlight. So you need to know, you know. A lot of times you're pointing at the analyst or he's pointing at you or she's pointing at you. And it's like, yeah, you take it or you take it. Uh, you see in, the, in, in your analyst's eyes if they've got something to say. You sense when they're finishing their break. They're able to, you know, pop you in the shoulder visually that I got something to say. Or you're, you're able to tell them, hey, your producer's saying I need to get to break so you can do whatever. Um, so that is really important to me in broadcasting and especially in sports uh, television so just trying to recreate that a little bit is is good but it's it's crazy stuff i mean 
you got a monitor with the game on it. You've got a monitor with live stat speed. Then you've got a big quad monitor with program and ISO uh, and some other stuff from it. Uh, lights, cameras, you've got your phone going. You've got like five or six devices going. And the one thing I found doing it this way is it doesn't give me time to look down at my board and, and notes and get storylines and stuff like that. So you know, you, you really almost have to know those going in because you're, you're so hyper looking at the screen, looking at your analyst, checking stats, that it's like you, you're, you're almost afraid to take your eyes off the screen. Uh, because in an arena, you can you can look down and you can still see guys running in front of you. Here, you got to look up and see them there. And for you, let's talk about last baseball season. Uh, I know it didn't start the way you wanted to, obviously, with a delayed start. And then again, your schedule changed a lot early. But how did it finish for you? Take us through that whole year experience for you. Well, look, I'm, a, I'm essentially a free agent. I'm not the voice of the team. Um, and so... The last few years, I've done games for MLB Network um, as a freelancer. I've filled in for uh, some people, filled in for the Giants. was lucky to do some NCAA uh, tournament stuff for ESPN. And so this coming year, I was going to fill in uh, for a couple of National League teams on television and uh, do my normal MLB Network games. And then obviously with COVID, it, that wiped out like 45 or 50 games. Uh, nobody needs to fill in. And MLB Network, like all the other networks, were doing started to do games just from the studio. I mean, literally, guys uh, calling the games from a, uh, uh, the studio. So um, it, it, the good news was in August, Turner called and said, "Hey, we want you to do some Sundays." But the way their their setup was, uh, you would call the games out of their Atlanta studios, and either an analyst would be in there with you, or they would have an analyst in New York in another studio calling the game from somewhere else. But then they, they had uh, Georgia had travel restrictions and all of a sudden you know, they called and said, look, we're sorry, we can't fly you in because of travel restrictions. So it's like, I'm like, ah, hmm. so I was thinking I'm going to lose 45, 50 games and not do any baseball this year, which look, it's a global pandemic. But they, you know, thankfully Turner called me back in September saying, we really need you to do this game. And, um, it's the Cubs and the Brewers. You're going to be in Atlanta. Ron Darling's going to be in New York. And so I flew in to Atlanta. You go in in one of the big studios, and you're in a corner with all these um, monitors. And there's no one near you because the floor director statistician is like uh, 50, 60 yards away in the other corner because of distancing. You know, Ron Darling's in New York. And so it was that the start of that game was really hard because it was a bit of a delay. You could see Ron, but it wasn't quite. And it turned out it, it, it was a no hitter. So we got to like the fifth to the sixth inning. It was Alec Mills no hitter. Um, and he's got a no hitter going. And all of a sudden it's like I'm, I'm on national television. I can't see my analyst. I'm all I can see is are these little windows and it's a no hitter. So, um, you know, those last three innings were really a, a white knuckle ride because you know, as a as a play by play guy, you want to know ball off the bat. Is that going to be a possible hit? Um, is that going to break up the no hitter? Uh, you do have an all. It's not like in football; it's all twenty two. In baseball, they call it an all nine. So you can kind of see where guys are playing, but you can't see the ball uh, on that view at all. So, thankfully, and and Ron Darling is the best. So um, you just kind of sit on his shoulders for the for the for the afternoon. Uh, thankfully, we got to the ninth inning, and it was cl a clean uh, show and clean calls. And then I remember the last out was uh, a ball hit hard up the middle. And the thing that you learn doing the games remotely is that you hesitate just a little bit before you make that call because you're not sure. You can't follow ball off bat to fielder. You're following the cuts of the director. And uh, Javi Baez, I knew that he had, was shifting on a left-handed hitter, and I forget the hitter's name. Uh, but the guy hit a, he hit it, uh, smoked it up the middle, and it, off the bat, your first reaction was, that's a base hit. The two outs in the ninth, no hitters up. But you hesitated enough that you remember Baez has been sh shifting, and sure enough, the, the next shot reveals Baez is there, has the ball over to first, that's a no hitter. And then I just remember walking out of that studio going, that's the hardest thing I've ever done in my <laughs> life. Um, but, it was, you know, look, it's the challenge that, that, you, that you face, and, and um, 
and it was a fun ride. So uh, then Turner called and said, hey, we want you to do the wild card series. So I ended up with Jimmy Rollins doing the wild card series. Uh, we were the only announced team on site for the wild card round. We were in St. Pete. Uh, it was great to see the Rays. Um, just love their story. Um, and you could see in those two games that this team is just really good and good enough to win the World Series, and they darn near did it. So that was my baseball season. I, I lost a bunch of games, but I got a no-hitter and a postseason series. So <laughs> crazy times, man. Yeah, pretty good way to finish up. And, you know, we'll talk about your time as the Marlins television voice coming up, but what have you liked about being on national broadcasts, whether it's MLB Network or the stuff you got to do with Turner, and especially a playoff series? Just how much did you enjoy that national experience? Well, the, the um, playoffs were fun because it's the playoffs. And even though there was no one in the building, you could feel the intensity and the, and the focus. And, and that was really fun. Um, you know, for my, in my career, I've had a chance to do a lot of national work early with ESPN. That was my first real big job in, in television. Um, and then with some Fox Saturday stuff and, and uh, you know, CBS has been great. They'll throw me on uh, some CBS games and the CBS Sports Network is national. So I understand the, um, the line that you have to walk if you're a national broadcaster. Uh, you you have the objective view, and you're balancing out the storylines and, and all of that. And and invariably, uh, especially in the postseason, when, when in in any sport, basketball, hockey, fans are so used to their home voices that they see that um, the national guys is always hating their teams. And you're getting notes. You know, I think if you do a good job, you're getting a note from each fan base saying, "Why do you hate our team?" <laughs> so I really didn't get that though. Um, you know, the, the, you know, you tell the stories of both the Rays and the Jays, and, and it was a short series. Um, so it was fun. I, I, I enjoyed it. It was, um, and I like doing national games. They're different, but I love being the, I loved being the voice of a team. That's a different vibe and a different intensity. And we'll get into prep a little bit later, but just how different is the preparation as opposed to, because you, you know the Marlins. When you're the TV voice, you're with them every single day. As opposed to parachuting in and doing two teams, I mean, you watch baseball, so you know the teams, but having to kind of learn both teams um, a little bit more from a ground floor approach as opposed to being uh, an everyday guy with a team. So how different was the approach of being that regional guy as opposed to being the national guy when it comes to preparation? You know, it's, there are some differences, but not that different because it, my style as the voice of a team when I was with the Marlins, uh, and Tommy Hutton was, uh, we, we both did this. We prepared a lot, uh, almost as much on the visiting team as our team. Because you're, the team that you follow, you know the storylines, you know the stats, you, you, you have constant communication. But we always made a point to you know, develop a, a relationship with the manager, uh, develop a relationship with the, the pitching coach. This is the opposing team, if you're the voice of a team. Uh, be down at batting practice, not just for your team's batting practice, but go to the other team's batting practice. Go every day to listen to the manager um, of the other team talk, because not only will he tell you stories about his team, but he's going to tell stories about your team. And so then on your telecast, you can tell, you, I mean, you can, it's one thing for you to say, John Carlos Stanton is a, is a beast and is, is just, you know, crushing the ball right now. But your fans hear that all the time. So, if you go down and, 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 and talk to Bruce Bochy and Bruce Bochy says the hard part about Stan is there are no holes right now. If we throw it two feet outside, he hits it 500 feet to right field. Suddenly the viewer hears that and it's not you saying it. It's Bruce Bochy saying that, which I think holds more weight than, than me saying it. Um, so, but back to your point. So the, the, uh, the mechanics aren't that different, but there is more time. You, you, uh, you certainly, you know, I knew, I had a pretty good idea of which teams I was going to get. Um, I knew I'd be in the American League, so that week leading into the uh, postseason, I listened to games, I watched games, I followed games, I, I you know, developed a body of research and stuff uh, for each team, and then uh, you know, got to, to St. Pete and uh, watched, went back on MLB.tv and watched a few other games. Buck Martinez was great. He pre he prepped me on the Blue Jays, the, the ins and outs of that. Uh, Brian Anderson was really good uh, with the Rays. He prepped me on on some of the ins and outs and the local knowledge. 
Uh, and then you, I did my boards and my stuff just like, uh, in fact, I've got, I know you guys asked for props, so that's actually the oh, ones yeah. I pulled. So along with the scorebook for the actual game, this, these are my boards for, you know, Blue Jays. I just went down roster, uh, coaching staff, uh, on the back, bullpen arms, what they throw, stuff like that. And, and so I prepared that for both the Rays and uh, and I did this with, when I was with the Marlins for both teams. So both the Rays and the Blue Jays. And, and in, you know, the stuff here for me is um, Bo Bichette's 22. He grew up nearby uh, Lakewood High School. You know, stuff that you can find somewhat in the media guide, but you'd have to search it. And obviously when you're doing the game, and especially on television, you don't have time to really leaf through media guides or whatever. So... You know, and then little other storylines, things they've done during the year, hot streaks, whatever. Then you get the notes and you highlight the stuff that's current in the notes. And that's, uh, to answer your question in a long-winded way, that's the prep for, for me for that postseason series. And then you get, we had great access on Zoom calls with uh, both managers. Uh, uh, I think we had pitching coaches before the series as well, and we had a few players too. What's the fraternity like, uh, um, like uh, amidst MLB announcers? So hometown announcers before every series, before every game, or are you, are you going into the booth talking with other TV announcers, other radio announcers? I, I feel like everybody, it's all interconnected. I feel like everybody is really good friends in the league because it's all, it's a grind for everybody. It is. Um, you'll find that, and if you, there's some great announcers out there that that are similar in mind to uh, to how we were in Miami in terms of. We want to know as much about your team uh, as we can because we want to be able to do the game and, 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 and do it properly and know, you know what's going on. And, and you can go to them for information as well. Why is, uh, why is Biggio uh, not hitting second in, in this team? Why isn't he playing second? Why isn't he, why is he playing third? Uh, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's terrific people in, in the game, broadcasters, both on radio and TV. And if you need information, you can go there to get them. Some of those announcers will come to you, some won't. Um, but I think it's important uh, that you you touch base with them, not just at the start of every series, but during the course of the series to find out, you know, something going on in the clubhouse. Is there a move coming up? Why did they not go to the right-hander last night in the eighth? Uh, questions like that that only someone close to the team or somewhat inside the team would know. Let's talk about how you got to the Marlins and eventually doing national work. Uh, what were some of the early steps you were able to take going from being a college baseball player to finally in the booth? And great to hear your dog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's Bobby. She's uh, good. She likes baseball. So good. She's, what kind of dog, by the way? Uh, <laughs> she's a, a rescue, so uh, and a and a lively one for sure. Um, no, look, I was a, a I was not traditionally. I wasn't a didn't go to broadcast school. Hold on. I got to close the door before I, the dog makes an appearance. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, let's see the great background you have. I like the mask on Curious George. Yeah. You like that? It's, yeah. It's my kid, George. I've got, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a guy that has a lot of autographs or autographs stuff. Uh, I've never been into that really, but I do like a good bobblehead. I mean, the, the best bobbleheads here, the racing sausages. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. And then, <laughs> The Dan Ugla piggy bank. So little things like that that I like, I'll keep. Um, so uh, yeah, getting to the Marlins was a uh, <laughs> it was not easy. Uh, I, I, look, I, I was I'm not a traditional kid that grew up wanting to be a broadcaster. I wanted to play shortstop for the for the Oakland A's or the San Francisco Giants. Uh, I was a, a high school athlete and just decided I wanted to play uh, college baseball and did. Um, and I was pre-law. I went to a school, UC Davis, that didn't have a broadcasting uh, department. They did have a student station that I got to fool around on a, a little bit. And I, I was a good college shortstop, and but not a draftable one. So I wanted to get to the big leagues in a bad way. And I just decided, okay, I'll be a broadcaster. And I was so naive to think that I could do it. And it's like, all right. So I screwed around a little bit on the uh, student station and sent my tape everywhere and realized uh and made phone calls to every you know school this that and the other and i realized that there's been a person in that position for 30 years and they don't need anybody 
But I talked my way into a minor league hockey job in Spokane, Washington. I had never seen a hockey game live, but I'd watched it on television. By the time I got the job, it was on radio, I was able to do it. And that led to minor league baseball in Spokane. That led to small college football and basketball in Spokane, um, which was great for me. That was my graduate school right there to learn how to be a broadcaster. And then I, uh, I spent a year in AA in Wichita, three years in AAA in uh, Las Vegas. Got fired there when the team was sold and the new owner had a friend that wanted to be a broadcaster. And that was devastating because it's like you're tri- you climb to AAA, you feel like you're right there, and just like that, you lost your job. But it was one of the better things that happened to me because I went back to the Northwest and uh, started doing hockey again in Seattle in the minor leagues. And the Mariners needed a post-game radio host on a weekend, uh, which is essentially fielding uh, angry callers every time the Mariner bullpen melted down. Um, this was in the Lou Pinella era. And that's, that was my first job in the big leagues. And that, that, the, the hockey on television in Seattle got me to doing regional sports on the regional sports network. Um, the Big Sky Game of the Week football basketball was my first real big job, which was awesome. Uh, but at the same time, the Mariners signed a deal with that regional network to do their first cable package. And they needed somebody to host the pre- and post-game show. And the, you know, thankfully, the regional network looked at me and said, well, he's done six years of minor league games. He's, we know he can do baseball, and he's on our air. Let's put him on there. And that's, uh, that started me there. I, I, I worked my way into filling in on play-by-play. I got bigger uh, regional stuff um, in then the Pac-10 conference. ESPN saw me and hired me, and I was there for six years and did uh, lots of college football, some basketball, and some baseball as well while I was filling in with the, the Mariners. But I wanted to be the voice of a team and, and you know, applied and, and was lucky enough to get the, the Marlins job, and that's how I got to Miami. And you mentioned those years in the minor leagues, and sometimes people can get a minor league job and just stay in that job for so long, not be able to do much outside of it. But I know for you, the experience you gain outside of minor league baseball can help a lot in trying to move up the ladder. Some people are able to stay and move up on their own, but just how important is it to be well-rounded, do you feel like? Uh, Look, all the sports that I did, all the things that I did helped me climb the ladder. I mean, if you're talking about a ladder, there's a ladder, but if you're talking about a single sport, there's individual ladders and I always felt that what what helped me immensely I mean hockey got me on the air um it it got me to minor league baseball um it got me to small college football and basketball all of those things helped me get other jobs and I think if you're trying to go up the ladder in your sport sometimes you're you're helped by going up the ladder in another sport because I wouldn't I would not have been hired to do uh, the Big Sky Game of the Week, if I hadn't done all the other sports no one wanted to do, volleyball, uh, women's basketball, wrestling, boxing, whatever. Whatever I could do, I did, because it. I was in the mode of I just need to get better. And the only way I can get better is being on the air. And all of those sports, um, you know, the, the small college football and basketball led to uh, the regional stuff, which led to ESPN. Uh, if I had not been on television doing hockey, if I'd s- just stayed doing minor league baseball, I don't think I would have ended up where I am. Um, and that, you know, I lost my double A job over that, too. So it's like I did two years of single A, went to double A, had a really good year in Wichita. But I was I was supposed to go back to Spokane to do Eastern Washington football and basketball and uh, the hockey another season. And the owner of the Wichita team said, look, we really love you but we want you to stay in Wichita and sell outfield signs and uh, program ads and be one of our sales guys. And then we'll let you do the games, you know, for five months of the season. I said, I can't do that. I'm, 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 I've got to go. I've made a commitment. Got to go do this. And they said, well, you're fired. So that's how I lost my double A job, but it was, a, it was, a, it was the right move because um, I, I don't think I would have been able to get to major league baseball without doing college football and basketball. I don't think I would have been able to, to get to college football and basketball without doing the hockey. And I tell a lot of young broadcasters that, that, that you know, call you up and say, hey, what, what can I do? And I say, look, you're the voice of this team in this sport. I know you want to get to the top there, but do other stuff. Find, find another college that needs a, a voice. There's so many more options now for broadcasters, regional uh, uh, networks. 
um, conference networks, uh, find and, and do. It doesn't matter what this. I mean, look, I did um, swimming on radio for the Goodwill Games on a national network. The Goodwill Games came to Seattle, and I was in the minor leagues, and they were looking for people to do stuff. I did um, the U.S. Olympic trials uh, bicycling on radio, where you're like in a little car following the peloton or whatever they call it, and it's, this guy's in the in the lead and stuff like. Back then, it was like a big cell phone like that in, in the car, and then uh, swimming on television. And at first, I was like, "How do you do?" Or excuse me, swimming on radio. I was like, how are you going to do swimming on radio? But it's actually really easy. It's like calling a horse race. I mean, it, it, and it's Olympic. These are, you know, it's the great Russian swimmers, the great American swimmers. And it's like, to, you know, 200 meters, they dive in. And it's like, you know the lanes. You can pick out the people. And that hell, Every little thing like that has helped to get me where I am. And I've always done football and basketball, no matter where I've been. Even in Miami, I did uh, ACC and SEC uh, football and basketball for the great folks at Raycom uh, and at Fox. Um, and then CBS uh, called me, and I've done CBS for the last, I want to say, six, seven years. So I think it's really important for a broadcaster to do other sports um, because not, you know, very rarely is, is somebody going to go from the minor leagues to the top spot and they're going to be the voice of a team for 30, 40 years, man. It's, it, it gives you more exposure, more experience. It makes you better. Um, I, I just think that's a really important thing is to do other stuff. And while you're moving from job to job and really good jobs and, uh, how much was networking and relationship building a factor for you? It's one thing to do a good job on the air and an executive to see that, and then hire you, hire you for another position. But how important was it for you to make sure that you were creating your network, you were reaching out to people, you were creating relationships to get from one stop to the next? Well, it's enormous. Um, and everybody's situation is unique. Uh, if you don't go to Syracuse or Northwestern or Arizona State or whatever, uh, you don't have an alumni or people that can help push you forward. So for me, the people that pushed me forward were just some terrific people, minor league executives, um, producers that you work with on, on your way up, executives, um, people that push you forward, um, you need that. And, and obviously it's, you know, networking is one thing, picking up the phone, hey, this, that, and the other. But being a good person and, and being a good team player the best networking is the are the people that are around you, um, and the people that you work with on a, on a day to day ba basis. Now it's important to develop relationships, and the one thing that I learned that helped me not only in the minor leagues but even in the major leagues is okay. So I, I, I know I'm not going to be the voice of the Braves. I'm a Double A announcer, and I, I'm not going to be that. Um, but if if I'm able to uh, make a contact in the Braves office or uh, in the regional network or uh, a AAA GM or something like that. And I, I'm able to get them their attention and say, hey, look, can you just listen to my tape for two or three minutes and give me a little bit of um, feedback? That's huge. Um, and then follow that up with a thank you note. Follow that up by, do you mind if I come and sit in the booth and watch your guys work? Is it okay to go watch Chip Carey and Joe Simpson uh, work this Wednesday? I'll, I'll, I won't bother. I'll sit in the back. Because it shows that executive, uh, that woman or that man, that, you know, look, you're willing to do, to learn. You're, you're coachable. You're interested. And that you're conscientious enough to follow up with a note or a call. Um, because that executive may not be the one that hires you, but that executive may hear about a job somewhere else or maybe someone that knows somebody else um, and you may end up working for them in, in 10 or 15 years. So networking is certainly important, but I think the most important networking is, is are the people that you work, the people around you, the conference you work in, the network you're working in. Um, that's all important too. And um, 
yeah, the feedback stuff is big. That's the only way. That was the only way that I knew how to go higher was just get better. And I approached it like an athlete, um, which is what I, I was an ex-athlete. How do I get better? I, I find people I trust, whose opinion I trust. I find out what they think. I take instruction and I make changes. And just like if you're an athlete and you make a change, it's going to feel weird at first. It doesn't feel natural at first, but eventually you're going to get it and you're going to be better because of it. And let's go off of that point. You mentioned feedback. So working for the different networks that you have and working at the highest level of the profession, what is the feedback system like from executives and, and broadcast directors, whether it's in the major leagues, MLB Network, CBS Sports Network? Are you hearing feedback from people after broadcast at this point in your career? Actually, I'm hearing feedback from my dog trying to get into my office right now. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, I'm going to open the door. Just okay. On. There we go. Come on, buddy. Come on. You'd be on the show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it depends on where you come here. All right. This is Bobby, everybody. Hey, Bobby. Just want to come in and see what's going on in the show. Hey, Bob. All right. We have our screen grab now for the YouTube video. That's right. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So, um, you know, it depends on where you're working. Uh, there are some teams or some uh, places that don't give you uh, feedback. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunate. The people at CBS are just great. The, the talent people there, um, Ross Malloy, Ben Stauber, Steve Karasik, um, they're terrific. You, they, they really do a good job of telling you, this is how we like to do the game. This is what's important to us. These are the mechanics that we like in crunch time, uh, in football or in basketball. Uh, we have calls every couple weeks to go through stuff. You'll get texts after a game from executives saying, hey, good job on this. What happened on that? Way to go on that. Um, that's, it. that's great. I mean, you want to know what you're, what, what you're after. Um, there are some uh, networks or some places you work, you, if you don't get a phone call, it's good news. Um, so it just depends. And I think, too, it's look, it's a subjective thing. Um, this feedback. That's why I said you, you find someone you trust whose opinion you value, um, whose style, if it's another announcer, whose style you respect or like or is similar to yours. Because I had an experience early in my career where I was working for uh, a group and I remember going through a series of meetings, you know, to say here's a review of, of what we like. And you sit down with one exec and it's like, you know, I really don't like the way you do this. You, you got to stop that. You don't, you know, just stop, don't do that. Okay. And you walked out of that office thinking, wow, man, I'm, I'm, I got to change here. And then you sit down with the next person and that person says, I really like the way you do this. And I really like the way you do that. Just keep doing what you're doing. It's, and it's like, then you you think to yourself, all right. So, <laughs> you know, two people, same organization, same level of education, one likes mint chip, the other likes strawberry, right? I mean, it's like, it can be as simple as that. So if you're getting the feedback, make sure it's a feedback from either the people that are you're working for, so you know what they value, or it's an announcer or somebody that whose who's opinion or producer, uh, whose opinion you really trust that you know can help make you better. Looking at your time in Miami, just what can you tell us about being the voice of a team kind of on a day-to-day -day basis and riding the highs and the lows of that team and also making sure you keep everything fresh for an audience that may be watching you every night. Maybe they're tuning in twice, once a week. How do you keep everything fresh when you are the voice of the team and doing so many games? I, you, it's a really, you have to challenge yourself every night to be, um, look, our style in Miami and my style is smart baseball, have fun some sense of humor, make sure everybody on the telecast shines and, and has a great time. So um, that being said, on a, on a nightly basis, uh, being the voice of a team is sort of like a, a, a soap opera, a telenovela or whatever, where, uh, you know, last night's episode, uh, this happened. What's going to happen tonight? Well, remember two weeks ago when these teams got together and there was a brawl or whatever like that. So you're constantly refreshing that storyline. Um, and, and you have no control. Here's the thing that it cracks me up. 
a lot of times people associate your value as a broadcaster with the team on the field. If the team's great, you're great. If the team is winning, um, uh, you know, getting to the postseason, boy, you, you're doing such a great job, you know. That's easy. The hardest part in broadcasting is when your team isn't any good or your team has fallen out of um, the playoff contention. It's out of the race in, in August. So that's where you really have to um, – that's where you really have to be creative. And we used to have a saying in, in Miami, uh, we're not going to let what happens on the field dictate how good we are tonight. We are going to have a great telecast tonight. Doesn't if, it, if, they, if they win, if Yelich hits two home runs and they win by 10 runs, it's going to be great. You know, if Bartolo Colon sticks in their ear, we're still going to have great telecasts. And you have to have that. You can't hang your... Uh, star on your team's success. So being the voice of the team is a lot of it is that is every night you have to say we're making great television tonight and we're going to connect. We're going to have some little something for every fan because there's kids watching. There's experts watching. There's uh, guys and gals sitting at a bar watching. There's um, senior citizens watching. Everybody needs a little something. You can't go over their head with with uh, you know, analytics without explaining what that is and then giving them something that, that you know that they will like. Um, and I, there's a trust, too. One of the things that I, from the very start, and I still remind myself, is fans aren't stupid. People watching aren't dumb. They're smart. They have as much information about the, the sport and about teams than you do. In fact, they can get to it faster because you're doing the game and they're sitting at home with their phone or their device, right? So don't don't assume that you can pull it over their eyes. That that call that you know the pitch is outside the strike box. Don't say, "Well, that's a strike." It's not, right? I mean, if there's a close play at the plate and the guy's out, but everybody wants him to be safe, he's out. But there's the video. Fans, the video doesn't lie. It'll tell you that. So be honest with the fans. I think, you know, especially, you know, if, if the team's not playing well, fans want to know why. They're not happy. They don't want to hear you blow smoke uh, and say, boy, all these guys are playing hard here and they're, you know, 25 games out of first place. Um, no, they want to know, okay, so why is this team bad and how is it going to get better? And that's the other trick of that is if a guy is slumping, if the team's not getting it right, it's incumbent on you, I think, as the voice of the team to find out why, whether it's a manager, whether it's a pitching coach, whether it's the player themselves, what are you struggling with? What are you doing to end that struggle? A uh, great example was, well, I'll go back to Stanton again, when he was in Miami, he would go through spells of, of mass terror and 500 foot laser beams. And then suddenly for a week or two, he would swing at everything. And so uh, Frank Manichino was the hitting coach at the time. Frankie was great about telling us, all right, so here's what we're doing. He's not taking BP outside. We just put him in the, in the cage with the, the slider machine. And he just he stands up there and he sees slider after slider. And we make sure it goes out of the strike zone. And he recognizes. And then we'll send one in the strike zone. And, and – and, he, and Frankie would say, okay, the things to look for for him to get down, he's got to get his foot down a little more early, stay a little more closed. And when you see him take a couple walks or you see him hit a sharp ground ball to right or a line drive to right center or to center, those are the signs that he's coming out. So if you're able to communicate that to your fans, hey, here's what they're doing to try to fix this. I know he's 0 for 3 tonight with a couple punch outs, but here's what they're working on. Well, all of a sudden he walks. And you're able to say, all right, well, that's a good sign. All of a sudden, there's a 100-mile-an-hour you know, ground ball to the second baseman. Okay, that's a little sign. And that at least gives the fans some ownership of how a player or a team is trying to turn it around or, or get back into it. So those are just some of the things that I think are important if, you're, if you are the voice of the team. Uh, you're passionate for your team. Um, 
you know, you, you've got to be emotional and passionate when they have the big moments. Um, and, uh, you know, when it's not going well, you also have to be entertaining. You have to be honest and you have to be able to inform them and, and be the conduit for the people on the field, the coaching staff, the front office in terms of here's what we're trying to do to fix it. Well, in September 2016, you had to do that under really tough circumstances with the news that Jose Fernandez tragically passed away. You get that news on a Sunday. Marlins are back playing baseball on a Monday night. Just how did you gather yourself to be able to come on the air under very emotional circumstances that Monday night for that broadcast? Yeah, it was, um, that was not a, a, fun, a fun time. You know, the, there were a lot of hard things there. The Sunday was really hard because he was killed early in the morning. And the Marlins were supposed to play the Braves at 1 o'clock. And uh, we all got texts at 9 a.m. when the team found out. And it was get to the ballpark as soon as you can. Um, there wasn't a game, but we had to, I had to host the, uh, the pregame show, which came on at the normal time. And part of that was the, um, the press conference with uh, uh, Don Mattingly and, and the, you know, everybody. And it's just so um, emotional. So hosting that was really hard. And we didn't have a lot of time, uh, again, because the, the Mets were in. You are playing that night. And, um, you know, uh, that was a, a really um, – that was the, the really – the hardest thing um, that I've done in, in broadcasting because you, there's no blueprint for it. You know, you uh, um, you can't call up uh, a, another game and say, "Well, this is how how to handle that." And the thing about that telecast was the team. There were very little of what went on on the field uh, was scripted or the team planned. Hey, let's do this. Hey, let's do that. There was no time for that. Um, Al Leiter was my analyst, and I remember uh, we have a, a um, really talented producer, John Sulser, in um, in Florida, and uh, Christian Roberts uh, was our um, uh, director as well. And, and so we had a big production meeting before, and you know John and I spoke, and, and we had talked earlier in the day, and the, the kind of the game plan that we had was what we see what we feel and what we hear, that will take us where to go during the telecast. We didn't have a lot of pre-produced structure. John had a lot of Fernandez clips from his naturalization to his rookie this, all this ready, but he didn't format it. He just had it. So as the game went, that's where you would put it. But I mean, you knew it was going to be just a different game. The uh, you know, the players, it's a seven o'clock game. Players didn't come out on the field until moments before then, uh, just to run and, and throw. Um, and John, you know, they're doing a pregame show. And so John sent me on my phone the video of our uh, montage into our open, which was player this, player that, shrine outside. And I'm looked at it on my, I watched it on my phone. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm good. So we start our live open with Al. And that pops up on the monitor, and it's the same shots, but now you realize since it's on the monitor, um, those players are openly weeping. And, you know, how do you, at, at that point, how do you keep it together? And that was, you know, I did, barely. I mean, I get emotional just talking about it. So throughout the night, there were all kinds of moments like that that we just let it happen. Um, you know the D Gordon home run is a, is a great example of that. He home, you know, he, nobody knew he was going to come to the plate with Jose's helmet and bat, go from the right side, um, and then flip over from the left side. He hits the home run, and I remember, and the, there was a pretty good crowd that night, and they were obviously emotional too. Home run leaves the ballpark, and you call it, and and D's round and getting to second, and I just realized at that moment, nothing I can say here is going to be any more poignant or better than silence. And I knew, too, that at home plate, we had great sound. Uh, we had microphones that picked up everything. We had a camera person down there as well. So I knew that when he got to home plate, um, his emotions 
the team's emotions, players' emotions. Um, that's the thing, right? And so I just shut up. And, you know, him getting to the plate, embraced by teammates, uh, barely getting through the dugout, guys crying in the dugout, D, uh, you know, kind of collapsing in their arms. If I'm talking over that, that's that, that's no good. So I just, I shut up. And I'm, I'm really glad I did. Um, and then just put a finish to it at the end when, you know, Cologne was terrific. He got off the mound. He let the whole thing happen. Um, but then the rest of the night, all those moments were not scripted. None of that was scripted. It was just reacting. And I thought our, our crew uh, did a really good job of just what we said, what we saw, what we felt, what we heard. That took us where we uh, wanted to go or needed to go. Uh, in covering that game. So, and that, I, uh, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. I'm proud of my work there, but I've not watched that game, and I, I, um, I don't think I ever will. Yeah, and the way you called that home run, because I watched it back today, and that's, that's a clinic in how you handle that situation. The way you know that you're on TV, you let your producer, your director essentially do their job and, and tell people what happened but take me inside the booth how emotional are you after that you know that was watching that i mean i grew up in new jersey so i was watching the sny broadcast of that and i think gary keith and ron were were pretty emotional about that moment too take me inside the booth because it was so remarkable in how that happened that d gordon home run well i mean again you know a lot of the ceremonial stuff was not scripted. There wasn't time. And obviously that's not that, you know, I just remember seeing D come up and it just didn't look right. And then I realized he had a different helmet on and then he got in the batter's box and then, you know, nobody had the information that that's Jose's bat and that's Jose's stuff. And he's going to get Jose's stance. And he did. Um, yeah. I mean, when, when the ball left the yard and I got the call out and then I shut up, I remember looking at Al and Al looking at me Hmm. and it's just like, wow. Um, And, you know, there were, um, there were moments uh, through the night Mm -hmm. where you were just like really close to just losing it. Um, But the game gets you through it. Mm-hmm. The game, you know, you, you know, you got to call the game and you're not sure how do I treat this game? Is, is a double in the gap a big deal? It's, you know, kind of a big deal, but you have to put it in some perspective of what everybody is is uh, is watching. The biggest moments to me were the the uh, the humanity of 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 the game. Terry Collins uh, and the Mets were just terrific, right? Uh, the Stanton speech before the game, unscripted. We had a camera there. The camera's mic was was good enough to hear it. It's just incredible stuff. So uh, I got through the game until the end. Uh, and that's, as I tossed it, well, I had to write a piece, uh, like about an hour before the show, I had to write uh, like a two-minute piece. And they did a great job of putting the video to it as the game went along um uh and and by the time we got to the end of it they had completed the piece with video that they had and video footage from that night and as i tossed to that that's when i lost it um you know i know you know you talked about gary and keith and and ron i know gary and those guys in their open lost it Mm -hmm. um and i was fighting it uh in in the open and the whole night but it was once i you know, once I tossed it to that tape, that piece that I had written and voiced, uh, I was done for the night. And that's when, you know, both Al and I kind of let go. And it's, I mean, you can see you're still emotional about it. And it was just such an incredible moment, that home run. But transitioning a little bit, um, for you, what makes good play-by-play on TV, and for me, I'm I'm kind of new at it. This is like my third year doing a lot of television play-by-play. So just learning the ins and outs of one transitioning 
from radio, being able to utilize talk back, uh, the talk back button, being able to know what you're seeing is not necessarily what the TV audience is seeing. So making sure that you're paying attention to the program monitor and all those little things. For you, what what makes good television, uh, being that traffic cop that a play-by-play guy or, or gal is on TV? Uh, um, I'll, I'll use an analogy for athletics. Television is a team sport. Radio is more of an individual sport. I like television because I was a point guard and a shortstop, and I like that team aspect to it. So uh, for me, um, and I'll always make the analogy of a, of a basketball analogy. To me, a, a play-by-play announcer is the point guard. The analyst, the woman, or the man sitting next to you is the shooting guard. If I score 30 and dish out five assists and the analyst gets 12 or 14, we're going to lose. It's going to be terrible. We're going to get killed. I'm going to feel great about all the cool stuff I said, but the show is going to suck, right? So it's important, I think, that the shooting guard goes for 30, has a great night, gets the ball where they can score. As the play-by-play announcer, if I get a dozen and dish out 10 assists, we're going to win. Now, I'm going to hit some big shots, right? I'm going to hit a, a, a clutch three and then a dagger shot, and then we're going to win. So play-by-play on television, I think, is all about being a good teammate, and that's something I've always believed in. And, um, you know, television, you don't need to be too descriptive. It's narrative, but you've got to be on the play. You've got to find the right time to mix a story in. Um, I don't put a lot of stats on my boards, just, you know, basic stuff or interesting stats that tell you the story of the player or the value of the player. Um, so I don't get too bogged down in that. Um, but I think I, I'll tell you a good uh, an, um example to me i've always felt that way about um and there was a guy at espn mo davenport who's my um coordinating producer for football always gave me that analogy that point guard analogy that you're there to make that person shine and by doing that you're going to shine and so i always felt that that being a good teammate was important and my first year after the marlins the giants asked me to fill in on on their telecast giants telecast I mean, the, the two telecasts that I hold, held, you know, above all others, maybe three. Um, the Mets, uh, w- w- incredible um, chemistry, great uh, humor, smart baseball. Uh, Cubs uh, with Len and JD, same sense of humor, a little drier, but still good. And, and, and just the baseball is great. And then the Giants, Crook and Kipe the best chemistry, the best vibe. I mean, they captured that ballpark, that team, that city. They did that really, really well. So I was going to fill in for them. So I decided to go and hang out for like a week and just embed myself, listen to Boach, go watch batting practice. And I asked if I could sit in the back of their booth, you know, for a, a few innings, listen in there. Um, and then I'd go sit in and, ra- and radio too, uh, because you had to do some radio. And the thing that I discovered confirmed to me um, what I felt about them and what I held important was they are great teammates, incredible teammates. You you watch them work and listen to them and, and you're around them, and you realize that Crook and Kite are fully invested in everybody on that show having a great time and having success whether it's the sideline announcer, Amy G, who doesn't need a lot of help to be great, uh, whether it's the production truck, whether it's anybody, the stat, someone keeping stats, someone in the booth, whatever. Those guys want to make sure everybody around them is good and having a great time. And that was great to see because it confirmed what I'd always felt and what I've always tried to practice is one of the biggest things you can do as a television play-by-play announcer or an analyst, be a great teammate. Fully invest that the person next to you or around you is is going to uh, have a great night and have a great show. 
We know we're running short on time, but we definitely wanted to see the spotting boards and all the prep materials that you have nearby. Just what's most important for you, uh, regardless of the sport, when you're getting ready to announce it. Uh, just what do you need to have to feel like you're ready, Rich? Um, all right. So, uh, you know, I showed you the baseball thing. So, like, I'll keep uh, a scorebook, but I like having this around so it's a quick reference. Uh, I'll show you the Rays. Uh, there's the Rays. Uh, you got players here. You know uh, where they were drafted, or you know, so how old are they? Awards they've won. Coaching staff here, manager here, other stuff about the ballpark. Closer um, and on the other side, you know, bullpen arms. What, what what's a guy throw? Um, that's baseball. And then I obviously like to go through the notes and then highlight stuff that's in the current notes, just so I know where to. I like to organize my stuff where I can find it. Not where I, I have a terrible short-term memory, so I can't memorize all this. But if I can organize it where I know it is and, and where I find, I find it, just by organizing it, it, some of it seeps in here and, and I can find it. Uh, basketball, this is, a, this is typical basketball uh, for me. Um, you know, kind of a board for both teams uh, with notes, highlights. Again, I don't like a lot of stats. Um, I'm not a big stats person in, in terms of, you know, uh, Matt Mitchell of San Diego State in the last two minutes is a 70% field goal shooter or this or that. You know what? That's never going to make air, right? I'm more interested in the story of Matt Mitchell. How did he get here? How is he playing? What did he do last game? Um, what has he done to raise his game? Uh, how does he fit in their offense? What did the coach say about him? What did the opposing coach say about him? Those are the things that are, are important to me. Um, this is football. Uh, and, and look, like any announcer, I started doing this a long time ago. You get better at it. You change it. You, you figure out stuff. So this is, uh, who is this? Boise State uh, from a football game today. You know, basic team information. I like my wide receivers on this side in numerical. Um, I keep my offensive line here, running backs here quarterback here, uh, kickers here, and then uh, you just flip it over and there's the defense that they're facing. I, I liked, you know, one of the things I did really early on was keep um, keep the defensive backs on the same side as the receivers. So obviously they're going to be matched up uh, and, and it's easy to find corner safeties, corner safeties. Um, yeah, that's it. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm not a, I'm a, I'm a big believer in this, um, and it's something I found out really early doing Major League Baseball in, in Miami. Is that, and I said this earlier that folks at home have as much information as you do. And in fact, they can find it faster. They can find game notes online. Uh, they can get all the advanced stuff like that, right? What they don't have is they don't have the access. They don't have the um, ability to go to Joe Madden and ask Joe Madden about his pitching staff or his hitters or something like that. That's the stuff that I think as, a, as announcers uh, is the goal. That's it, man. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I think about the postseason, uh, the best moment I think I had was a, a story about Manuel Margot. Um, and that's in, in terms of prep, that was like reading the, after game one, Margot had a big home run. Um, in the paper the next morning, there was a story about Margot and the fact that his father had died of COVID. And, and I kicked myself because it was like, dang, I didn't see that in my prep. That would have been great to use then. Um, and so the next morning for game two, I asked Kevin Cash about that. And I asked about, you know, as a manager, especially of a highly analytic team, you still have to manage people. How'd you manage that? Well, Kevin Cash said, well, this is really tough. But he added so much more to the story. He said Margot's family was in a, a near fatal auto accident uh, early in the season. The, his car caught fire. The family got out of the car. The car blew up. He lost almost all his stuff. Um, and his dad got COVID, and it was really hard on him. And he said, and, and the guy that pulled him out was Willie Adamas. Uh, he and Adamas were like, you know, in COVID, you had to work out with a partner. And Adamas was like his guy. And so that morning in our production call, uh, Dan Keener was our producer and the great John Moore was our director. I went through this and I said, look, we got to tell the story. Margot homered last night. You know, yesterday he and Adamas were like on the top step, inseparable, uh, you know, shoulder to shoulder, leaning on each other's legs, whatever. Uh, here's this story. 
we got to find a way to tell it. And so the, the game two was a blowout. Uh, and we got to like the sixth to the seventh inning. And I, you know, I t- asked Dan and, and John, I said, hey, let's get to this if we can. And they did a terrific job because they were, you were able to tell that story. Um, you know, he comes to a new, new team. His family is almost in this horrific accident. Uh, his dad's sick of COVID. Adamas is the guy that bonds with him. And, and they had just terrific shots of the home run from yesterday. Adamas, the first guy there. Adamas and him, inseparable in the dugout. Margot's emotion, all of that. And that, to me, is the prep. And that, to me, is the stuff, man. Uh, it's not the fact that, uh, you know, Adamas is hitting, you know, 325 with runners in scoring position or, you know, his, uh, his numbers for this or numbers for that. That story, for me, um, was one of the highlights of, of, of doing that postseason. And it, it was all, it always goes back to what we just talked about teamwork. You know, you have a really good producer in, in, in Dan and, and John Moore, the director. Uh, Jimmy Rollins is, is next to you. You get that information by talking to the manager and, and asking him about the story that you saw in the, in the newspaper that you read that morning. And all of that together fit. And it was, uh, for me, was a, a, a great moment as a broadcaster. And, and I uh, hope that it was for those that were watching. Absolutely. Well, Rich, we know we got to let you go. You've given us a full hour. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, just really great insights on the business. And I also got to say a big thank you to you and especially Tommy and Souls for welcoming me to the Marlins organization years ago when I was in Jacksonville so well. Let me hang out and be that kid in the back of the booth for a little bit. So just uh, thank you for everything you meant to my career throughout the years and just uh, look forward to watching more of your games in the future. Thank you again. No, I appreciate it. I'm sorry the dog inter- interrupted a few times. And sorry, I got a little misty eyed there uh, talking about Jose and, and, and that game because I don't talk about it a lot. And it's um, but uh, certainly it's look, it's a great way to make a living. I get paid to go to ball games. Uh, it's fun. And so I'm, I'm appreciative. I've watched your show, uh, you know, when guys like Boog and Len come through and, and Gaff and, and those guys. So uh, keep up the good work. Uh, and, and for all the broadcasters out there that are wanting to trying to get to the big leagues, man, you can get there. You just got to get better. You got to hang in there. And um, that's it, man. Thanks, Rich. All right. Thank you. All right. Our thanks to Rich Waltz and, Waltz and thank all of you for watching Broadcaster Hour. So long, everyone.